Hello, I think we're live. Yes, brilliant. Hi. Well, a big welcome to um, 38 Degrees members um, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, I'm here in Dundee um, and um, I'm joined here by Stuart Hosey, who's Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party. Um, this is going to be a live streamed question and answer session for English, Welsh and Northern Irish 38 Degrees members with Stuart. Um, and um, as I said, it's coming live from Dundee. We've been doing quite a few of these live stream events um, during this election. They're, they've generally been opportunities for voters to quiz the politicians who would like to persuade them to vote for them about the issues that matter to us. We've actually just done exactly that with Scottish 38 Degrees members here, here in Dundee with, with Stuart asking him about um, tax dodging. Um, but this live stream is a bit different because um, Stuart Hosey and the SNP aren't asking um, English, Northern Irish or Welsh 38 Degrees members to, to vote for them. Um, in fact, if, even if we really like what Stuart says, we're not going to have the opportunity to, to vote for them. Um, but despite this, the Scottish National Party has nonetheless become one of the biggest stories, um, particularly in the newspapers, of, of this election campaign down in England. Um, we're seeing lots of headlines about the Scottish National Party, um, lots of them not very complimentary at all. Um, Stuart's boss, Nicola Sturgeon, has been de described by the Daily Mail as the most dangerous woman in Britain. Um, and uh, we're also seeing lots of headlines about the SNP planning to hold England to ransom. Now, 38 Degrees members don't automatically tend to believe the Daily Mail or um, politicians when they tell us that we shouldn't like something. Um, I think um, lots of us can see very clear reasons why, why these, these newspapers, these media barons and these politicians would say the things they're saying. Um, so what we're hoping that this live stream question and answer can, can do is provide us an opportunity to do some of our own research, um, to get beyond the spin, beyond the headlines, and hear directly from someone senior at the Scottish National Party about what the Scottish National Party really stands for and what impact they would like to have on Westminster politics. Um, there's going, we're going to start by um, hearing, hearing from Stuart, and then I'll go very quickly into questions. Um, I've got some questions that have been submitted in advance on Facebook, and um, I'll also be taking questions that are, are submitted to the live stream as, uh, as they come in. So if you're watching this live, please do add your question. Um, I think we, we should have a chance to get through a lot of them. Um, to start with, though, um, I will, I will just, just go, go over to Stuart and, and ask you, I'm, I'm sure you are, going, are not going to tell us that Nicola is the most dangerous woman in Britain, and I'm sure you're not going to tell us that um, you plan to hold England to ransom, but I think it's a question we would like to ask you is, well, what would you like your impact on, um, on the, this election, on the outcome, and on the future government of the whole UK to, to be? And ha what, what effect would you like to have for, well, for those of us that don't live in Scotland? Uh, let's just kind of set the scene. The SNP is a mainstream social democratic political party. Uh, we're not some kind of insurgent force. We've been the government of Scotland for seven years, and it's a, a credible, popular government. And not everything they do is, is right, uh, but by and large, popular and respected. Uh, we're also uh, the party who does believe in Scottish independence, but at this election, because we've just had the referendum, we couldn't be clearer. This election is not about independence. It is not a rerun of the referendum. In essence, in Scottish terms, it's about holding Westminster to account to make sure they deliver on the promises made to the Scottish people before the referendum last year. And that was for maximum power for Scotland. But in terms of where we are in, in the UK, we are saying we want to see an end to austerity. That's a genuine end to austerity. Very popular in England as it is in Scotland. That's a half percent real terms increase in public expenditure. That will release 140 billion pounds for investment and spending over the next five years. The alternative is the 30 billion of cuts voted for and signed up for on the 13th of January by the Labour Party, the Liberal Party and the Tory Party. So it's a very clear position we have a real end to austerity. And within that, it means we think we can fully fund the NHS across the UK, now, meeting the obligation or the, the, the requirement of the Stevens Report, which is 9.5 billion real terms increase in the NHS in England, uh, with the uh, 
commensurate uh, increase in Scotland. We want to see an end to spending £100 billion on Trident and its replacement. Uh, money we simply do not have. Again, a, a position which I suspect is equally popular down south uh, as it is in Scotland. So a mainstream social democratic party uh, was standing hoping to win the election in Scotland. And our judgment is, with a strong Scottish voice, uh, we wouldn't leave Labour to their own devices. Uh, we would be able to push forward to see proper funding the NHS proper funding of the public services, a real end to austerity. And I think that's really important in terms of this election. Thank you. Um, Alan has a question. Actually, there are a few questions along a similar theme. So Alan asks, will the SNP work for the good of the whole UK, not just for Scottish interests? Um, then there's a few other questions kind of along similar lines. So I'll give you a, a few and then you maybe... So, so, so someone else is asking, are the SNP's friendly approaches to the Labour Party just a clever tactic? tactic in the battle for Scottish independence. Would you really want to encourage a more caring society south of the border? Or would you worry that this might make Scottish people less keen on independence? <laughs> no, the, the arguments for more power for Scotland, for full fiscal autonomy, for Scottish independence, the arguments for and against stand on their own. Uh, our judgment is very clear. The whole of the UK cannot afford another five years of Tory-led government. Uh, we're an anti-Tory party. We want to lock Cameron and the Tories out of power. And what we've said to Ed Miliband is uh, join us. And I'm pretty sure if the UK polls are right, if there's a hung parliament with the SNP in a pivotal position, it would be pretty bonkers of Ed Miliband not to speak to the SNP, not to be able to get his policies enacted or to hand the keys to Downing Street back to David Cameron. So yes, we want to do what's in the best interest of Scotland. Of course we do but we also want to do what's in the best interest of everyone in the UK. And our judgment is that means locking the Tories out of power and ending austerity, because we can't live in one of the richest societies in the world when people are going to food banks, for example. We can't see the value of benefits erode year on year on year. We've got to be more ambitious for people who are in work poverty to say the minimum wage should be £8.70 an hour by the end of the next parliament. There should be more encouragement for the living wage so that there's not the dependency on benefits. People should be getting a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. All of this is in the manifesto. Uh, we're doing much of it within the uh, Scottish government and we want to drive forward that progressive agenda uh, throughout the whole of the UK. You said just then um, that you're, you're an anti-Tory party, and actually Judy has just asked a question on the live stream about that. Could, could, she, she says that there seems to be real hatred within the SNP towards both Westminster and the Conservatives. Could you explain that, please? Well, it, it, it's not hatred, but, you know, the memories in Scotland of Thatcher and Major, of deindustrialisation, are uh, still very raw. And the memories of this uh, latest Tory a Liberal government uh, are almost as bad. You know, just to put into some kind of context, in Scotland alone, the impact of the benefit freeze has affected 835,000 people in Scotland. Mm. Uh, the people who are in work are around £1,600 worse off in real terms. And at the same time, we saw the same government give a tax cut to millionaires. So we need to bring social justice and fairness back uh, to the system. But it's actually more important than that because all of the ec economic evidence now is clear. If you squeeze inequality out of the system, you actually provide a stronger platform to grow the economy and create the well-paid jobs we need to increase the tax yield uh, to deliver the services we all depend upon. It's a, a mainstream social democratic message. It's immensely popular in Scotland. And, as I said, uh, I suspect it will be very, very popular in England as well. Yeah, we're getting some comments suggesting there is a, a level of popularity for, for that. <laughs> for that. Um, uh, but but I, I think it's coupled with this, uh, 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 these questions around um, how, as a nationalist group, you reconcile yourself to... This is D Dr. Dr. McNeil. Yeah. Is that, how, how, as a nationalist group, how do you reconcile yourself to working within a system to deliver those kind of outcomes, which you, at the same time, nominally want to reject. Well, at the referendum last year, we set the gold standard in terms of democratic engagement. This was an absolutely legitimate, internationally recognised uh, referendum. It was an act of national self-determination in, the, de determination in the, the best possible sense. 
that's the only way we can achieve independence. And there can't be another referendum until there's a shift in circumstance, until the people want another referendum. Uh, and until then, we've got to do what's in the best interest of Scotland, which means more powers, but also means an end to austerity, not just for Scotland, but for everyone in the UK. I mean, we can't be in a situation any longer when so-called national projects in London get huge chunks of funding and there's no consequential spending in Wales or Northern Ireland or the North of England or Scotland, which is why we're suggesting, for example, let's build HS2 north to south and south to north. I don't think it's right to spend 50 or 100 billion pounds on a train line from London to Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds when Newcastle and Edinburgh and Glasgow and Dundee and Aberdeen won't benefit from it. So let's build infrastructure that benefits everyone on the islands and let's take the kind of political decisions over tax and spend which also benefits everyone on these islands. That will not change the argument for or against independence but it means we'll be living in a fairer society which is self-evidently the right thing to do. I saw a good follow-up to that question, but I, I can't now find the name of the person who, 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 who asked it, but I'll ask it anyway. Apologies if, if it was you and I'm, I'm not name-checking you. Um, so somebody was asking, would you, would you then accept that uh, as part of participation in, in a UK government in the next five years, you would, you would rule out a, a referendum for at least the next five years? Well, we've been very clear that this election is not about uh, a referendum. We're not seeking a mandate uh, for an, another referendum. Um, but I'm not going to write the 2016 or 2017 or 2020 manifesto before we've even had the 2015 election. Let's be really clear. In terms of that question, the constitutional question. Which was Keith's question, incidentally. Well, Keith, I found him now. Sorry, Keith. Keith's question. We were promised by Gordon Brown last year, six months ago, that within one to two years we would have the closest thing to a federal state. Within one to two years. The Prime Minister said if there was a no vote, there would be an unprecedented programme of devolution for Scotland. So we need to hold Westminster to account, and they now need to deliver on the promises the public think they were made. Maximum devolution, right? If the public change their minds, if the public say, hold on a minute, we're being sold a pup, then I think any Scottish government, any Scottish political party would have to respond to that. So I'm not going to write next year's manifesto before we get through this election and we find out what's genuinely on the table from London. Sure, and on that, <coughs> I think it's a different key firm, is asking about your the SNP's position within, within Westminster on um, broader questions of political reform across the UK. Where, where would you stand on uh, devolution within England, um, uh, a fairer voting system, an, ele an elected House of Lords? Um, and within that, a question about whether you still support proportional representation, now you're poised to benefit greatly from first past the post. Uh, yes, we do, and uh, STV is uh, in the manifesto. I mean, Dundee, where we are today, is a classic case in point. Uh, the SNP can r run the council. Uh, we've 16 out of 29 councillors uh, on a proportional system. Under the first past the post system, we probably have about 25, but it's better we have a fair and legitimate electoral system where in any council there can be proper scrutiny and real opposition than to simply win, you know, 70-80% of the seats on 40% of the vote on a 35% turnout, which is what used to happen in the bad old days. So yes, we support STV because it's fair. Yes, we want to see the unelected House of Lords done away with. Uh, it should be fully democratic. I mean, imagine if the public in this election decide to kick out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 sitting MPs because the public say we don't want them to be our lawmakers anymore. And lo and behold, two weeks later, they're putting on an airman jacket and they're turning up being a lawmaker in the House of mm. Lords. Absolutely outrageous. Quite, quite wrong in the modern age. And what, what about the right to recall MPs? This is something that lots of 30 yeah. Degrees members have been campaigning for, a sense that at the moment MPs kind of have a blank check for five years and can be very, a lot of complacency and disrespect for their voters can come from that. Uh, uh, there should be a proper right to recall. Now clearly there needs to be checks and balances. It can't be on the back of a petition of a handful of people and nor can it be simply because somebody disagrees with the MP. Now that's perfectly legitimate, you know, MPs can change their mind on things. But if someone does something which is uh, heinous, egregious, then of course 
there has to be the right to recall, proper, legitimate recall. Um, Isa is asking about your position on the NHS. Would SNP MPs vote against any further privatisation of the NHS, including in England? Yes, absolutely. The NHS must remain public. And instead of seeing this kind of 49% of bed privatisation we're having down south, we think it should be completely public. It's why we've said within the numbers we've produced, we would meet the Simon Stevens, the Stevens uh, recommendations for a £9.5 billion real terms uplift in NHS in England. Now, clearly there's a you know, two billion uh, cash consequence for Scotland of that, and that's the right thing to do, but it means we take the NHS seriously, we fully fund it, and we don't leave it with the threat of privatisation and charges, which I suspect is the next thing on the agenda if there's another Tory-led government. I know that one th thing that ISA is probably referring to in her question is that uh, down in England, um, 38 Degrees members were very involved in campaigning against the Health and Social Care Act, yeah. which has changed the structure of the English NHS and kind of set in, set in train, um, well, we've seen just in the last year five times as much privatisation as yes. in the previous year, a kind of accelerating process. Would, would SNP MPs be willing to vote in favour of a reversal of, of, those, of those changes? Well, in terms of, if it's leading to privatisation, it's one of those things we look at very, very carefully indeed, because the direction of travel in Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK, particularly in terms of health and social care, is dramatically different. Uh, the coordination of certain aspects here, all within the public sector, a different approach down south. So, yes, because that may well lead to privatisation and charging, and therefore have a consequence in Scotland, it's one of those areas we'd want to look very, very carefully at indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you would, you would have to be, have the case made that it has an impact in Scotland as well. I detect a certain amount of hesitation. We, no, no, we would, we'd certainly look at it. I mean, part of our objective is to try and bring progressive politics to the UK. Mm. That's important. Uh, so I'm just not going to prejudge. It might be some of the me measures might be sensible. Um, so I would want to look at that very carefully. And as I say, if uh, it was leading to privatisation, if it was leading to uh, a loss of funds, if it was leading to charging and the erosion uh, of uh, universal provision, it's one of these things we would want to look very carefully at. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. I think 38 Degrees members will be very forthcoming with the evidence of that. Right. We're, we're seeing a lot of, as the decisions have been pushed to these clinical commissioning groups across England, that's been coupled with um, a lot of pressure on them sure. to adopt private provision. Um, let's... Stay, staying on, on health, health for a minute, I guess. Would you, would you be... See, um, Jeremy, I think it is. Yes, Jeremy is asking, would, would, would your policy of free education and free medicine in Scotland be something you would be seeking to extend to the rest of the UK? Um, I would love to see that. Um, now, the Labour Party have suggested they'd like to see university tuition fees come down. It would still be £6,000, which is a huge amount of money, you know, a massive amount of money. Um, but at least that would be a reduction from the 9,000 or 9,000 plus that uh, can happen down south at the moment. Um, so yes, we would love to see free education. We'd love to see the tax on ill health removed. Uh, and the First Minister has been very clear. Uh, we would support Labour if that was one of the manifesto commitments, one of the things that were in their Queen's speech that they wanted to get through to reduce tuition fees down south, yes. One of, one of our Scottish members who's here in Dundee with us um, is asking if she, she can ask a question, which I think we should let her, although I'm going to make sure that English questions yeah, yeah. dominate this bit of the debate. It's We've already had a conversation in, uh, about tax. So, Lynn, yes. It's about the fact that we have free prescription here in uh, Scotland, um, but my understanding is that we can afford it because our population is not so high, um, but it's perhaps not quite as sustainable in England, um, and that's one of the questions that the English people ask. And, um, I just wondered if it is sustainable. So it's a question about the sustainability of extending a free prescription charges which are currently available in Scotland to England. Yeah. Proportionally, it would be the same. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is political priorities. Uh, we have prioritised lifting the tax on ill health. It's the right thing to do. We prioritised free education. It's a huge investment for the future. Uh, these are the, this is the language of political priorities. You know, if the priority of Westminster is £100 billion for weapons of mass destruction, that's not our priority. So I think there's a 
strong case to be made for progressive policies like that in England. It clearly would take, a, I suspect, the Labour Party to want to adopt these things, uh, but they'd have to change their other priorities as well. Mm -hmm. So it is sustainable in England for that to happen? There's no reason why it shouldn't be. This is simply about political choices. Mm -hmm. Moving to a different issue area, Jeremy is asking, can you confirm that you and the SNP accept that climate change is happening now and that it is primarily caused by human activities? Uh, yes. And in terms of tackling it, um, we've always had a lot to say on that. In Scotland, as you know, we've got, I think, the most ambitious targets in the world in terms of renewable energy. Uh, those targets are, uh, well, I think we're halfway to meeting them at the moment. But there are issues in order to make sure we maximise our potential, two issues in particular. One is connectivity to the national grid so that we can actually benefit from the huge offshore potential in the northwest of Scotland. Also that's the, offshore wind. That's offshore wind mainly, but uh, other renewables as well. But it's also an issue in terms of Longanet power station, which is under threat at the moment. I think they're charged around 40 million a year to connect to the grid. A comparable station down south would get a subsidy. This must end and end quickly. But there's also another issue in terms of the feed-in tariffs and the way that renewables and other uh, energy generation is funded. Uh, we've seen uh, nuclear energy getting a strike price at twice the wholesale rate on a 35-year contract, and the rate goes up if the second uh, nuclear generator is built. Renewables get a lower strike price, and they can only give a maximum 15-year contract, which makes some of the projects unviable. That is an overt subsidy to nuclear, which actually weakens the ability to build up the renewable capacity. So these are two issues our MPs will take to Westminster because we need changes on those in the next parliament. You mentioned nuclear there. There's a question from Jim about um, Trident, nuclear, yeah. nuclear weapons. Um, would the SNP are a pledge to remove all Trident nuclear bases from Scotland? Would, would the SNP insist that Labour agrees to proceed with full removal of Scottish Trident bases as a prerequisite of any Labour SNP coalition? Well, coalition's probably ruled out by Labour, and we always thought it was the least likely outcome. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, if there was a five year confidence and supply arrangement to give Labour, a minority Labour administration, certainty, we'd have to agree many things, and one of those would be a red line on Trident. Clearly, if they wanted to run on a vote-by-vote -vote basis for five years, there'd be no agreement. And if them and the Tories wanted to proceed, we would vote against it. There's no question about that. But if Labour wanted the certainty of a five-year deal, we could not and would not support the renewal of Trident. Can't be clearer. Five minutes left, I'm, I'm being told. So please, if you've, if you've got a question, now is the time to, now is the time to ask it. Um, Adam's got a question about the Barnett formula. Um, uh, he, he says, using the flawed Barnett formula, Scotland gets a lot of money um, rather than spreading the wealth. Do you think it's fair that Scotland gets so much money and do you think it should be reduced? Well, it doesn't get so much money. It's true that we spend more per head on our public services. But for the last 34 years, we've paid substantially more in tax per head than the UK average. So it's wrong to suggest that Barnett allocates much more money. But the key thing about the Barnett formula, even with the very limited devolution we have and the very watered down proposals in the Smith Commission, the Barnett formula will reduce in importance, I think, by around 70%. And so the anxieties people have in the way this has been misrepresented over many years, that we somehow get far more than our share, it was never true, but will certainly become less true as the Barnett formula is eroded in importance over the next little while. Thank you. Um, I'm, lo I'm looking, look, looking for a kind of final theme for a final couple of questions. Um, uh, this, this is probably an interesting direction to go. And P Peter is asking, wh why is Nicola Sturgeon the only person we're hearing anything from, from the SNP when she's not an MP and not a pro prospective parliamentary candidate? Why is the campaign not being fronted by the leader of the SNP parliamentary party? Well. I did the uh, UK live economy debate last week. I did the live TV debate last night. And to answer that question directly, uh, Angus Robertson, the leader of the Westminster Group, is doing the live defence debate uh, this afternoon. Uh, so I, I think 
while Nicola is front and foremost, she's the leader of the party, um, all of the key figures, whether it's Angus or myself or John Swinney, uh, are taking our full share of the media opportunities. <laughs> I guess maybe, maybe, I think implied within your answer is that some of those, um, some of those media opportunities are focusing quite a lot on Nicola Sturgeon. And that, that, there's another question that, that, that relates to, to that. Um, uh, Green Genie, which I suspect is an online name but rather than a real name, um, says that, she says that most of the tabloid press are, seem to be suggesting that half the people living in Scotland are da as dangerous and ter as terrorists. Um, how is that going down north of the border? What, what, how, is, how is the, that kind of, in, how is that insulting so, depiction so, some being of, received? Some of the language is ridiculous. Uh, and I'm sure you can imagine, uh, you know, normal people, everyday people from every walk of life who happen to want independence or who happen to vote SNP, look at this stuff in whichever newspaper it comes and it's tomorrow's fish wrappings. Simple as that. That's, um, uh, that certainly reflects um, what, what some people here are saying about the Daily Mail as well. Um, a couple of, couple of quick policy questions yeah, maybe sure. to end. Um, these, are, these are policies which 38 Degrees members acro across the UK, and I think you, you know, including in Scotland, because you'll have heard from some of them, have, have prioritised. Um, on the subject of tax dodging, which we've just had yeah. a meeting with Scottish 38 Degrees members here in Dundee about tax dodging, um, could you just quickly um, explain for the benefit of our English members where you stand on the Mayfair loophole, this tax loophole that 38 Degrees members have identified and are campaigning to close? Well, we, we got very useful information, detailed information, uh, that the relief which would go to people who invest uh, was going to people, fund managers, who'd only put in a small amount of the money. Uh, at face value, that seems uh, wrong. That's an abuse of that loophole, and we have committed to say, yes, we will close it. And on, on the subject of TTIP, the um, yeah. Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, this, this so-called trade deal between, that is being negotiated between the European Union and um, the United States, um, where does the SNP stand on TTIP? Well, let's say in principle terms, there's nothing wrong with trade agreements in general. However, this trade agreement and the ability of multinationals perhaps to take governments or public bodies uh, to court, uh, we are incredibly anxious about. So there's a couple of key things. We want uh, exclusion written into the face of the bill for the NHS, for Scottish Water, and for our public services. We don't accept the broad guarantees which have been given so far, and there must be specific protection written in, written on to the face of the bill uh, before we would be prepared to countenance that. Another part of TTIP which um, our, our members are, are concerned about is the, um, the ISDS mechanism, the mechanism whereby um, corporations would yeah. be given a, a separate legal system through, through which they could sue governments. Um, where does the SNP well, stand it, on it, ISDS? It, it's ridiculous that corporations can sue governments through a different legislative or a different legal regime. If a government or a public body needs to be taken to court, it has to be taken to court through the existing judicial structures but it shouldn't be because a business isn't allowed to make a profit on the back of a public service, and that's the key point. So, so this, there's a sudden flurry of interest around this question. So, <laughs> so, so, so people are asking me just to clarify. So, so I couldn't be clearer. It, well, I, I, th I, think, I, I think our members feel you could. So if, the, um, if um, SNP MPs in, in Scotland were... Um, sorry, SNP MPs down in Westminster were were given a vote on, on a TTIP deal which included ISDS, no, no, the, you, you, would, you, would, we, you would vote against? We'd be, yes, we, we couldn't support that because that's precisely the issue. The public bodies or governments can be taken to court simply because these bodies can't be allowed to make a profit on the back of a public service. Uh, we've said we want specific exclusions on the face of the bill and in the absence we simply couldn't support it. I think I think that's pretty clear. Um, I'm just just looking to see if, <laughs> see if people agree. It, it, yes, okay. Um, so so we, we we've clarified on TTIP um, exclusion of public services Absolutely. and and ISDS as um, I think it's probably fair to use the word red lines describing those. Well, we certainly couldn't support uh, a trade agreement which had those provisions. That would be impossible. Great. 
I am I am aware that I was told that we only had five minutes to go six minutes ago. Um, so and that, that that probably means it's time to draw things to a close. So it only remains for me to say thank you very much to everyone who's been firing in the questions as we've been we've been going along and um, and who submitted questions in advance. I hope I've managed to. If not ask your specific question, ask a question on your theme. I've, de I've definitely been slightly overwhelmed by the volume, but I, I think we have, we have covered quite a lot of ground. I hope this has been useful as well, and that um, this video is something that um, you, you might want to share with friends who you have conversations with the SNP about. Just in general, you see this as a, an antidote or a, an alternative source of information to some of, some of the more lurid accounts of the Scottish National Party that have been made available um, via media outlets like the Daily Mail. Um, finally, I should, should thank Stuart Hosey of the Scottish National Party, Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party, for, for joining us here today. Um, I, I've certainly found it a very interesting discussion. I, I hope you've, you've, you've found it interesting It's fantastic and happy well. to do it. Okay, thanks.